So I will show you Graphoscopio. Well, a, a little bit of what we are doing in Graphoscopio. Graphoscopio is a tool that is working for uh, interactive documentation, data storytelling, data activism, and reproducible research. This is the short link of the web page. And the, the idea behind this tool is to explore the question for how do we change the tools that change us. Uh, this is because I made um, a, a PhD research. It's not in software, it's in the arts and humanities faculty, and my PhD is, in, is on design and creation. And it's also related with hacktivism. The idea is uh, uh, to also bridge uh, with uh, open knowledge and culture, the idea of city as a common and plural participation and voices. The we here is kind of uh, strange because my intention is to bridge communities. Um, so, uh, for example, I will be next week in a reproducible research sprint. Uh, I am this week here, uh, and I am trying to, to, to bridge the stuff that we are doing in, in, uh, in Bogota. So, yeah, thanks for, for this opportunity. And we are working in a local hacker space in, uh, in Colombia. It's called Hackbo. The idea is that we have a lot of diverse people in a set of workshops with different backgrounds. It's, this is not only for coders. So we have librarians, philosophers, journalists, uh, yeah, a lot of people from different places. And, uh, and the idea is to go beyond the classical coder. So we have a lot of projects. For example, in Hell, we made a uh, domain-specific visualization for medicine. In journalists, we take the Panama Papers uh, uh, investigation, and we port that to, to be used inside uh, a far environment using this notebook. So it's, it's time, trying to deconstruct the idea that you need to have huge computer resources to, to make this investigation reproducible. Uh, in activists, we are working with something that we call the Twitter data selfies. The idea is to, to take our data from Twitter and to start to see patterns in our discourse. Um, and um, we are making other stuff. For example, we use uh, the Graphoscopio manual. This is a notebook from Graphoscopio. And the idea is that you can like, express the way that the document is going to look and use Pandoc and other stuff to get this kind of outputs. This is the PDF that is produced inside Graphoscopio. And we start to migrate uh, some open publications that gives you the HTML, but they don't give you the source code. And we start to create this kind of source code behind and to explore other uh, templates, for example, like this one for the Data Journalist Handbook. We made something similar for the Data Feminist uh, recent publication for activists. And we are using a lot of uh, agile techniques for, uh, for documentation. We are making these documentatons. It's, it's called a book sprint and we create books together. This is a book that is produced uh, from Graphoscopio, and we can apply this kind of uh, Lua filters to, to create this kind of custom exportations. And we are working with an air quality network. Uh, so the idea is that we make workshops with people who is interested in air quality, uh, and we do this kind of data activism. Uh, so we have like these notebooks that allows us to to recreate this data and to work with the students from, from schools. And they create sensors and use Graphoscopio to visualize the data they collect. So that's uh, the core idea of what we're doing. It's uh, really like a big uh, glimpse. Uh, and in the future, we want to, to think about, uh, well, there is a lot of issues with, 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 when this stuff is made from the Global South. Uh, scalability, sustainability, and visibility is the stuff that nobody knows that is happening, except for the people who is participating there. Uh, we would like to improve the, the, the code quality. This is my first project in, in uh, small talk, so you can tell I need to, to improve the quality and the user experience. Uh, and maybe we're going to make some spec to migrations because I would like to see the interaction with, uh, with widgets uh, in GTK, like, like, I don't know, talking with the browser and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, that is mostly, and hopefully we can talk about that, uh, I don't know, in the beers or something. So, thank you. Hello, my name is Caleb. I'm a student at Walla Walla University in the US, and I have two years of computer science experience. My small talk experience comes from my professor, James Foster. He introduced me to it a couple months ago, actually. 
and I asked for an independent study project, and he gave me this to work on. My project is a Python interpreter, and basically the goal is to execute a Python module in Smalltalk. And here's a little bit of my code. I just um, coded a small game mastermind in Python, and we're using a Python module to um, put it into the AST form, and then we parse it into Smalltalk. And here's the load function, and you can see parse AST and read tokens. And some of the most notable classes are the PyAST classes, PyAST node, PyAST node with location. Two of the biggest are the Python expressions and Python statements. Here are some of the statements, continue, break, assign, some of the expressions, the for loop, while loop, and so on. Um, and then once it's parsed into Smalltalk, we execute it. Here's a little bit of code for the while loop. You can see we've implemented the continue notification and the break notification. And here is the program run side by side in Jade and in um, Python. And you can see it's pretty similar in output. If you have any questions or you want a small demo, come find me afterwards. Thanks. Hello. So my name is Rogliano Teo, and I work in the Armod team as an internship uh, this year. And my work was on migration and not only on, co on the compatibility layer. So what we are watching is a program written in FAO1 turning in a FAO8 image to the compatibility layer. So it's kind of slow because uh, I'm handling extension method by modifying the lookup and the lookup is done with each message sent, so it's kind of slow, but we can see that it's working and it's kind of nice to see all the application running in the newest version of the language. And that's it. Uh, hi, my name is Nicolas. Uh, I work in Mercap and I'm in Argentina. I just have two announcements for you. The first one is that uh, as every year, uh, we have a, a, jo a conference in Argentina that is for, from the small dogs. It's called the small dogs. So if you, um, um, that's the, the, the data for the, this year conference. It will be held in November 13 and 15 in Neuquén in Argentina. That's the site. You can have a look and you are all invited to come. Okay. Second, uh, in Argentina, there are too many small talkers. That's good. And we are grouping together to have a, a community. Uh, so we build the BA small talk community. It's a GitHub repository mainly, and they have a Slack uh, as well to, to interchange the ideas. Uh, and we started building some meetups as every year, but this, uh, the last meetup we made, we, we do it open for people, not only in small talker, but open. And that was really interesting. Uh, and well, there are a lot of people in the, um, in, the, in the repo. You can find some projects. Uh, and this is a list of, of all repos you can, you can find there. Some of them uh, were already uh, presented here in some talk. Uh, Stargate uh, was presented on Monday. So to have a different look of those repos, uh, we have some repos from, for web applications. Willow is mainly a framework for wrapping web applications. Uh, Renar, that was, uh, it's uh, something for writing CSS. Uh, Highchart, that is a rubber for high charts. Boardwalk, that is an extension for c uh, Then you have something for backends. Kepler, that is to modulate systems. Sagan, that is a wrapper for databases. It's the, the idea behind it is to have a polymorphic database. I will show something more. Stagate, that was presented. And then you have some other purpose uh, uh, application or, or framework there for gaming, for IE, or 
something we also put there docker image for far or for Shenton so that we can use it continuously okay so those in yellow have already been presented some of them uh, really far away Aconcagua and Chalten was presented I don't know if 2005 maybe and uh, Willow was presented last year uh, here in ESOC and uh, this year we present Stargate and for sh just to, to some examples in boy you can have some complements some extensions you can have assertion checkers or uh, bindings of the, the variables um, in board work is is a facility to walk through the through the site uh, it have extensions on different applications uh, in mole it, it's a graph model then in canon it's a, a, a state machine implementation uh, stardust uh, make uh, a model creation easier and Sagan is a representation as I said uh, in trying to be an implementing polyglot persistence uh, making the possibility to change between in memory and database persistence uh, and we also have there some specification that how, how to build a, a git repository with the structure we're making and some script that make it automatically for you and that's all. Uh, you can have a look about and it if you want. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Nuri. I'm the co-author of uh, Faro.js uh, with uh, Dave Mason. Uh, this is the update for uh, what happens during uh, the last 12 months. So uh, thanks to Iceberg and uh, the the. the Impressive work by, done by, by the, the Faro community. Now we have, uh, we can work, we have everything available on uh, GitHub. We imported uh, all of our previous commits from uh, Smalltalk Hub and add many more. Um, we did the port to Faro 7. So, uh, the last version of Faro GS was on Faro 5. Now we are on the, the latest version, and we're ready to migrate to Faro 8. We have all 329 tests green. Uh, we have uh, more examples and uh, uh, more uh, UI and uh, UI tests. Uh, something the video should start. There should be a video here. Yes. So just to because someone, I mean, um, Esteban mentioned UI test to, I guess, with specs. I want to highlight some tests we have where uh, when you run the test suite of uh, Faro.js, you see the, the JavaScript code that is generated from Faro running on a web browser, and uh, the test uh, runner controls ex ex the execution on the uh, web browser. Let's continue. There are smaller things that matter that, that uh, improves life. Uh, like uh, we I don't I don't see ah, yes we have improved the stability of the test framework uh, now uh, it works uh, as we expected uh, even if we, because all as you've seen when you run the test it needs to open the web browser there is a web socket communication that needs to be st uh, stable and need to be fast enough uh, uh, we've added a tutorial to make mobile uh, application. We've already given some demos about it, and now we explain how to make it with uh, Apache Cordova. Uh, we have now uh, recent, uh, it's a small fix to something that looks like a small fix, which is avoiding name collisions, but actually it's required uh, uh, quite a uh, uh, few weeks of uh, work to, for better integration of third-party uh, JS libraries because we can have a code that reuse existing JS libraries with your own Faro and have objects from both worlds communicate together and work together. There are also other bug fixes to ensure that everything works fine on uh, not only on Mac but also on Windows and on Linux. And uh, that's it for the, what happens last year. Now for the forthcoming 12 months. So uh, we are currently working on rebuilding the middleware the, that allows communication between Faro and JavaScript. 
uh, with the support for multi-threading. The goal, uh, the middleware so far, we are using it only for t test purposes, and it was quite dirty. Uh, the goal now is to make it more, uh, more cleaner, even more robust, to allow not only tests, but why not other kinds of application that uh, that mix the execution of uh, Faro and uh, JavaScript on, on production. Uh, another related topic that's more on the WebSocket side. We are, as I said, we are using WebSocket to talk to make uh, JavaScript talk to Faro during tests, and uh, we have something that works fine, but we need a cleaner API, something that can be reused in uh, uh, application in uh, for production. Uh, the last and important topic that is related to my startup project, uh, which is uh, making mobile apps. So currently I have only one app on the, the, uh, the Apple Store and the, the Google Play Store with the Faro inside uh, or generated by Faro.js. And uh, the goal is to have uh, more coming, so expect the announcement. And to finish, uh, yes, and this is the, the, the screen, the screenshot from the app that is currently available with mapping and navigation and so on. Uh, so uh, what we are going next? So now this to open the conversation with uh, people here. So there are different directions that can be possible for the future. One one is integration with the seaside. I have an, an experimental version working since uh, 2018. So if there is interest, this is one way to explore. There is desk, desktop apps also with Electron or as a backend uh, to use uh, JavaScript or web as a backend for to Faro instead of the GTK or spec. Why not? Uh, we one another way is to uh, join offer efforts and to share what we did uh, and collaborate with other uh, other projects in Faro GBM, Elysium, Py uh, Python Bridge. Uh, there is also porting what we did to other platform. Yes, so uh, it's time. My time is over. So keep in touch. And if you want to talk, I'm available. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Nalwen and uh, I work for um, Thales and uh, we have some little projects uh, to, show, to show you. We made a, a binding of uh, JavaScript for Faro and um, a framework uh, for um, user interface that uh, work with uh, block as backend. Um, so first, we have a little stream of uh, the robot uh, of uh, IoT. Nicolas Fabrand. Ah, yes. Okay, so with the, as you may know, I work at Hermod and we do IoT with uh, Alex Oliveira and uh, with the JStream binding and the block uh, interfaces, we will. Uh, um, continue working on our robot and have, as you saw, the small uh, camera stream, and we will be able to put directly our uh, control interfaces and buttons for the robot directly on the uh, video that you saw from the robot. At least that's the objective. And uh, that's the second project. It's um, a video player made uh, with uh, our UA framework. So it is, it's a um, Block has backend here that you can see. It's a button made with block. And uh, if I open the video, everything runs with, with uh, Faro. 
So uh, I haven't uh, an external uh, file browser yet, and uh, the window is uh, made with uh, FDL. Sorry, it's a demo uh, bug, so I will try, but... So, uh, that's it. And I can uh, pause and uh, play video. And everything around with uh, Faro. So, thank you. It's not GTK. It's not GTK, no. It's a. Uh, it's a Zell for the window, yes. Okay, so uh, I will start. I will not put that in full screen. Uh, so, hi everyone, I'm Vincent. I work in an Air Mode team. I'm an uh, associate professor. And as you perhaps you saw the, the talk of uh, Stefan uh, a few days ago, talked about Stephen and I because we're very new in the team, uh, he emphasized the fact that I'm a Python lover, uh, which is kind of true, I have to admit. And the thing is, I was, uh, so I fall in love now with Maltalk, uh, but I was a little bit frustrated not to be able to use Python anymore. So I decided to try to build a bridge uh, between the two. Actually, I tried to build a bidirectional bridge. By bidirectional, I mean a bridge that let me call uh, Python from Faro in a faro -ish way, but also uh, a way of calling uh, Faro from Python in a Python-ish way. And of course, a way of calling Python from Faro, passing Faro objects that you can handle in Python. I will try to show you that right now. So I prepared uh, some presentation. Can you read? Yeah. So the first thing here, I try to load, uh, and actually I load, um, uh, which is uh, a library from, an unofficial library for, uh, uh, for uh, Google Play Music. And I have to say thanks to Benoit, who give me his, he's here, who give me his uh, number and everything, so I can use the API with his account. So we will see what we can dig and find inside. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, I'll see. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps a beer. Anyway, so here, what I did is I logged into the API. I can watch what. Uh, the Python object, what it contains. And I will try to continue uh, to work on it. So I will load, uh, I will ask the API all the libraries. And you can see I re uh, the object I have here is actually, which will be a little bit big, but it's a Python object, which is a big, uh, a big dictionary. So I will try to go inside this, this dictionary uh, in a very farish way to get the URL of one of the album. I don't know what it is, so Benoit, we will see. And if we check that, if we inspect, we can see that the call now is done. So it's Lindsay Sterling. Okay, it's, it's safe. Uh, another thing I have here is just a small call to, uh, to Matplotlib, which is a library for uh, doing graphical stuff. So I will load Matplotlib, NumPy. I will create a first, uh, I say, um, I don't remember what this is exactly. It's a big list, and I will continue to do the call I can here. And I will try to output everything in a file that I can open right there. So this is the Faro calling Python. So now it's be, uh, it will be a very short uh, Python code. So for the one which not prepared, just close your eyes. And it looks something like that. So when I want to call Faro from Python, I just load the class, and I did. Here, uh, I use the parser to parse an expression. I get an AST. I will not execute it right away because I will try to show you a last thing very quickly. So this is the, the fair code, which is uh, the equivalent. 
Uh, so you can create elements, and you see you have something which is very Python-ish, and anyway, it called uh, Faro behind. And the other example I have here is just to show you that I can pass uh, objects, uh, Faro objects to Python. So I create a Faro uh, Python object here, and I pass to this Python object, Python object a block. The block will be executed and call and uh, print stuff here in the terminal, uh, I mean in the transcript. And if I look to the Python code, the other here is a block I get. So I executed my block and I use the result, which is a transcript, to see I log some stuff here. So I did a string, uh, I transformed the object in string. So thank you for your attention. So the project is here. If you want to contribute to it, just tell me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Martin Diaz from Argentina, now working in Chile with Alexander, with me, Tom, with the team of Alexander. Um, I will show you first the, a project that was um, developed by Diego Orellana. O Orellana. Uh, it's a, a software to to use in the scenario where you you, are, uh, you want to understand a JavaScript program and you that you don't know, so you, you download it and you open this tool to. So uh, it's uh, quite common to use for JavaScript uh, source code editors like uh, Visual Studio Code, Sublime, etc. Atom. And uh, in general, these uh, these uh, editors uh, have a master and detail view. In like, what we we did is Diego did uh, Alexander and me. We guided him uh, to prepare his uh, like his master. Um, so we extended the the master view, with, uh, uh, which is the 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 folders and the files of the project with a visualization that I will show you now. And the detail also, that is usually the, the contents of the selected file, uh, we extend it with a visualization that shows the structure of the file. So this, ah, okay. so this uh, small gift shows uh, it, each in the visualization that is uh, in the main pane, uh, the circles are JavaScript files. And um, the, usually, in the, it, for example, a JavaScript file can invo uh, require or import uh, another JavaScript file using this syntax. There is other ways, but this is one example. We use the, the arrows and the, the, the colors enforce the, the, the meaning of the incoming uh, reference and the, the outgoing references. Ah. And uh, sometimes uh, when we parse the program, as it is a static analysis, uh, there is some required to to a file that uh, it is not uh, you, it wasn't fine. We represent it with the dashed line, and um, also there is there, it is very similar how the JavaScript files uh, import an external dependency. It is uh, when it is like an absolute path, or it starts like this. Uh, it's a, an external, so this is a box. Uh, so now it uses Esprima. It's a parser for JavaScript that is quite popular. So he, here we have the like the typical master uh, part where all the, these are the folders and the files, and um, you have the the element. And uh, to do it short, you can also uh, you can search files. Well, time is short. Well, this is Hunter. So then I wanted to show all the things, but uh, I cannot. So uh, thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carolina Hernandez. Uh, I am a first year PhD student at AMT uh, 
Ja. Yeah. <laughs> eh, I am T. Eh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Eh, and I am part of the um, of the Armo team. I work with Luke, Stefan, Nuri, eh, Guiche, and Pablo. So I will show you today how to bootstrap a small faro-like kernel. Okay, a very small image. So I will explain to you what we're going to do. So we're going to start by reading a custom language definition which is absolutely independent from our definition of Faro. We will use an application. We will use an application that runs in a full Faro system. This will be our host. It will be called the, well, actually it will be a Faro 7 system. And the application will read the language definition and it will generate the kernel. This is the byte array. This is the image. We will have it in memory, okay? And after, before, writing this kernel into disk and executing it into the virtual machine, we will simulate execution of code uh, inside the host. It, this will be non-compiled code that is not installed inside the host system, uh, but instead it will be interpreted manually. Later, we will write the kernel and we will execute it with our virtual machine. And this part, maybe you will like it because later we will take the same image, we will load it back and we will inspect it. So, okay, so this is my bootstrapper application. We can see that here are the classes that will compose my uh, system. It is only 50 classes. We can inspect them and see their sources. We can see that the name of each class has the prefix PC. And we can see that, for example, I have my own implementation of blocks, compile method, context, etc. Uh, in particular, it's important to notice that I will have a class that will contain the, uh, the, um, the application entry point. This, uh, this code, uh, it will log into a file. Uh, it will write it to disk, uh, the next message, and also it will run some tiny benchmarks and it will, it will quit after. So let's generate our image. This process takes around 20 seconds. Uh, what it is happening now is that the application is reading the language definition loaded as a high level ring model actually inside the, the Faro system, the host, and it is generate, generating our byte array. So we wait, we wait, and yay. Okay, so now you, we have it in memory. We haven't written it to disk. What we are going to do is to simulate the execution of code there. Okay, so we will create an instance of our custom class uh, called PCArray. Notice that PCArray naturally is not installed in the host, but instead, in, uh, instead it's just uh, simulated. So we have this, we created an array, we put some elements, and we can see that even we have our own representation of nil. So we have integers, etc. We can even ask for the special objects array. So this is my special objects array, okay? As you can see, it contains custom of, um, it, it contains only the, the custom classes that I have uh, included in my language definition. Now we will write it to disk. We have it there. We go to our terminal and we will execute it. Using the, oh, sorry, clear. We will use the same virtual machine that we use to run a standard Faro image. So, oh, Faro. Okay. Let's check if the image did what it is supposed to, to do. This is the image, this is the log file. Actually, it did it. It printed the message and it ran our small uh, benchmarks. And that's it. But the most important thing is that notice the size of the image. It's 164 kilobytes. So it's very, very small. Okay. Okay. Now, let's come back to the application. This is the image in disk, the one that I just bootstrapped. It is written in disk. So what I am going to do is to load it back and to inspect it. So uh, this is very useful, especially when you have images that crashed and which are broken, and you cannot run them, run them again. 
And, but of course, this is just a work in progress. Uh, I am, for example, here from the image, I am recovering the special objects array. I have also the, the, the class of, uh, the table of classes, uh, etc. But if I continue to, we continue to work into this, uh, the idea is to be able to uh, execute code from do, do, that broken image, uh, yeah, uh, have, don't lose the high level abstractions, etc. So that's it. Thank you. And The code is there in case you want to use it, okay? My name is Peter Werner, and I want to uh, talk you a little bit over my private project. So this is based on the ideas of role modeling, which was founded from Trick-Berenskaup. And uh, since uh, Faro provides a, a spec, it is interesting for me because I have a free tool and the features uh, usable by spec are helpful for me. And I, I hope I can start now the final tool, which is working uh, by the rules of role modeling. The idea is um, to make a synthesis of that tool with small talk and uh, go to graphic orientation. That, uh, my vision is uh, so that graphic elements like diagrams are a build a symbiosis with text like commands we know from Faro and all they together are in program. So what I have done in the last years, I have made many experience, experiments with visual works. And so since Isuk 18, I tr make my first tries um, with Faro. And uh, uh, <clears throat> What I need for my tool first is a set of uh, low-level uh, tools like an UI designer, editors for icons, text and helps, and graphics, and an interface to Faro. And from these tools, I want to present you a little bit what I have already made. And uh, uh, these tools I used to develop my tool and I will be integrating these tools in, in my role modeling tool. So here, come on a bit nach unten. So these are the, 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 the requirements which I have. And I have started with some, uh, uh, I have started to, to learn Faro and, and to learn something about inside Faro, for example, how a system browser is working. And so I have uh, uh, add some uh, uh, commands in, in the menus. For example, uh, if I, I, can, I can select uh, to, to the, oh, oh, I can select to control, did it so? What was the command is here? Ah. <laughs> I don't know. Ah, yeah. Okay, I can I can I can select uh, some some uh, packages or, or or text, and then I can I can hmm? menu. Ah, menu. Okay. <laughs> okay. With two fingers. You push okay. Those fingers. Yeah. For example, uh, uh, find the string and you in, in that thing, things. For example, I take add and enter and so that was, was uh, my first simple uh, 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 tests. What I can do with Faro and I, then I have add a menu here to start my my tools which I want to, to 
develop. And the first what I show you is a simple pixel editor that is a, a poor a, a, a morph programming. So I can use more uh, such uh, uh, painters and I can load from, and that's just my first uh, uh, co uh, uh, tool, which allows me to save into class, into library or folder, and later on I want to save into my role models. I want to load here, uh, for example, from the FAO catalog, um, and I, uh, in any, for example, these, and then I say, okay, okay, okay. Doesn't understand. <laughs> hmm? You are trying to load or to save? Okay. I want to load. Because you, you click in save, not in load. Yes. No, 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 I want to do, do load. Load. Another one. Okay. Just maybe enter. Okay. No, oh, doesn't go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, these uh, the, these uh, 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 thing here, the, the, the save and, and the sauce. <laughs> Not my load map. Yeah. Okay. Enter. Enter. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now it goes. Yes, here I have uh, different functions. I can, I can uh, uh, make a circle inside. I can, uh, I can flip and so on and do anything. I can copy and then I can save it be again. And the interesting thing here is if I want to... It's time. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start. Uh, hi, I'm Kazuno Riveda from Sorabito Inc. And, but it doesn't matter who am I because uh, no one makes such a stupid game. <laughs> and yeah, this is Jenga and Jenga's roof. But uh, I skip it. <laughs> what is Smart Talk Jenga? Uh, Smart Talk is a very dynamic system and composes many classes. And I wondered uh, how many classes do the system need to keep it running? And so it, let's confirm. And these are classes. <laughs> Each piece is classes, and it's me. <laughs> so. Taking one class on a term from the smart system and taking all subclasses of this class from the system, not, not play, replace on the top. <laughs> and the game ends when the system crashes. Yeah. It's like <laughs> this. And uh, unfortunately, I don't uh, put it on GitHub repository, but uh, there's a gist. Oh, and so. I'll show you this. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. This is uh, this long red object. Red block is. Oh, I can't select it. To, uh, this is an object. And <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and this is plot object. And uh, can you see the blue block? Oh, it's, a <laughs> it's Mrs. Stefan Dikas. <laughs> but uh, 
And he inherits this uh, test after so if I do it across, <laughs> it takes a little time. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Dukas <laughs> vanishes from the world. <laughs> And oh, it's a buggy, so. <laughs> but uh, so I can continue it, maybe. Oh, it's uh, maybe dangerous, so right now. <laughs> what is uh, more safer? Maybe this is safer. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I can't ditch that. Maybe. <laughs> Oh, but it's still running, so <laughs> far is <away is> very <laughs> tough. <laughs> so, uh, so we have no time, so let's finish it. <laughs> no? Oh, I can't click it. Oh, oh, sorry, it's already broken. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> That's all, thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Pierre Michelabier. I'm working where I was working with the Airmod team to transpile, transcompile Faro to C code for VM purposes. But it, I built it in a way to be able to extend it and to try to be as generic as possible. So the aim is to be able to generate random C. Uh, for VM, uh, VM development as well as for um, just for our development. So, for example, um, can we read? No. no? Shall I start off? Okay. So, we have a C there. And, uh, yeah, I'm coming. Appearance, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, should be better. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. So let's say that I want to start my uh, my program with a main. My, I will uh, use the type inference that will give me a call graph starting from that point, and that will give that will tell me that for to translate a main, I need to translate as well. Uh, the set interpreter function and the factor iterator iter function method. Sorry. So after that, I translate that in, them into C, into C code, and I can compile them directly uh, and use them as a uh, plugin. So yeah, that didn't work on this. But when I do this, it's just translating the class. I remove the previously loaded module from the image. And I can ask for the result. So, for example, in this case, it's a factorial for nine. And if I modify it uh, here, mm -hmm. and regenerate a class and load the module, and we ask for the next result, it should have been updated. Okay. Well, I don't, I'm not sure it were, it, really, it actually worked the presentation. But anyway, the point was really to translate Faro to C um, using type inference and the modular um, modular design to be able to translate um, in any kind of uh, Faro program, ideally at least. And I'm about to start um, a PhD in a virtual machine as well in in the more team. So if anyone is interested, I, I would love to talk about it. Thank you. So hello again. Sorry for the yeah, perfect. Um, I will take this. Uh, so I will show you the small demonstration of what we can do with polymass and polyglot and Rosal three. And uh, it is the small experiment that I run in these uh, past few days. So it is basically just the sketch of the idea, not the complete tool. Uh, so what we will do is uh, we will take 33 projects that are already in Faro 7, in the latest stable version, and we will try to use the TFIDF and uh, TSNE, which was presented by Serge before, 
uh, to visualize them on the plot and uh, cluster them together into groups of semantically similar projects. So first of all, we select these projects. Uh, you will see them later. Uh, now we extract English words from uh, the source code. So how we do that is first we take the code of the method, this one. Then we tokenize it using the AST, so each token separately. Then we split by camel case every identifier name. We remove the non-alphabetic characters. And now we have something that resembles English. You can see that there are like words, sequenceable, and self, and so on. So now what we do is uh, we apply the TF-IDF. Uh, and the idea is that uh, it is the algorithm that assigns scores to every word, the importance of the word. So uh, the words that are appear often in this document, so in this project, and rarely in other projects, they will have high scores. This means that, uh, for example, sequenceable and uh, element will receive high scores in collections package, but uh, words like self uh, and they will be discarded because they appear common everywhere. Doing like this, we can take the vocabulary of all words that we have seen in Faro. So it's like entire English vocabulary, but only limited to the words that are used in source code. Uh, these are like 3,000, almost 4,000 words. And we build a vector of uh, scores. So for every word, we assign a score. Like this, we have the 33 vectors, so one vector per each project. And these vectors allow us to, you know, theoretically plot these words in the multi-dimensional space. So there will be points in the space with dimension 3,700 something. So now what we want to do is we want to reduce the space. We want to reduce the dimensionality of this data to plot it on a two-dimensional plot. Uh, so we use TSNE, uh, which was presented by Serge. And uh, yeah, I don't have the slide for it, but uh, basically it reduces the dimensionality of data so to two, two dimensions. Uh, then we do the Kamins clustering which is implemented in Polymath. And uh, what it does is uh, it clusters together uh, points that are you know, close to each other on the graph. And as a result of all that, we get uh, something like this. So these are the 33 points, 33 projects of Faro, uh, clustered together. And uh, if you see two projects close to each other, it means that developers who wrote them, they use similar words. So for example, uh, I will have to zoom in here. Uh, yeah, so if you look at this cluster, you can see that here we have Morphic, Polymorph, uh, OS Window, Commander, which is uh, more or less UI uh, packages. However, you can also see as unit. And it is strange, but uh, when I talked to Julien, he suggested that it may be the reason that as unit has a lot of uh, UI stuff integrated into it. So this can be a small that as unit maybe is not doing what it should be doing. Uh, then you see another cluster is like text, system, graphics, rubric, essence. But uh, this cluster is very close to this one. So you can see graphics are close to morphic. And then we have clusters like Renraku, Refactoring 1, Refactoring 2. This is Metacello, Monticello, Zinc, Network. And like this, we can analyze these projects. So. I would be interested if you want to you know, hear more about uh, specific algorithms or if you find this idea interesting and uh, you have some ideas uh, what we can learn from this kind of visualization. So it would be very cool to discuss with you. Thank you very much. OK, hello. Um, so I'm going to present a little tool, just so the, the scenario is like this, you're debugging something very complicated and you stumble upon an object and no configuration. There we go. And now you're wondering, oh, is this configuration object the same as this configuration object I inspected earlier when I was debugging? And the, you, you've probably stumbled into this very um, strange issue that I have the two objects side by side but no windows know the other objects, so you cannot write the equal equal you want to write. To this end, I wrote chests. 
So it's essentially glorified global variables, but that means you don't have to define the global variables when you want to do this. So the way it works that you have a little UI here and you want to here. You want to do something like this, and then you have both objects, and you can do things with them. E. Ta -da. Um, <laughs> so you can do a bit, few more things. So this was the default chest, but you can create chest on the on the fly. Yep. And you have more chests, and they appear here. Each chest has a, a, a unique ID, and you can add object to them as you as you would. Uh, which ID is this? Seven. Seven. And you have a little inspector to inspect your uh, precious objects. That's it for me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Herman. Um, well, I don't know why it's showing this. So, okay, uh, I'm going to show uh, a little bit about Quiz University. Yes, you know, uh, in Argentina, there is a big small talk community. I think one of the reasons for that is uh, we still teach teach small talk at the universities. There are many universities that uh, where small talk is being teached. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, we decided to build a specific distribution of quiz for the university with some tools. So uh, that implementation, we call it Quiz University. And it comes with uh, some packages already loaded, like uh, live typing, uh, Aconcagua, Shelton. And one that is the one I want to show now is that we call denotative objects, and it's an environment to work with objects uh, without classes. Uh, that's a well-known technique to start teaching objects uh, about objects, because at the beginning, the students, uh, it's difficult for them to understand the difference between instances and classes. So we used to use self, but the problem with self is that it's a completely different environment, tools, and all those kind of things. So switching from self to, to small talk was uh, pain. So um, we decided to, okay, do that in small talk and try to keep the tools as similar as possible to the tools of, uh, you know, when you work with classes. So this is the uh, denotative object browser. Uh, don't ask me why we call it denotative object uh, to that concept. But the idea is that you can add objects, I don't know, Alan Turing. Uh, and then you directly implement the messages on his date of birth. As you can see, nothing weird. Uh, yeah, let's say something like that. But an interesting thing is that you can uh, evaluate the message directly uh, because it's an only instance. There is no class, of course. And okay, the idea is for the uh, students to get you know, um, the sense of working with objects without the need to think about classes. Uh, it has interesting stuff like if you inspect an object and you inspect it again, it returns the same inspector, uh, those kind of things. And of course, if you have, uh, for example, here, and you know, we, with this tool, we make the, the students work on problems like uh, Boolean, how to implement Boolean. Uh, so let's say I want to see, you know, I send the message and to false using true, that that's true. Okay. Uh, you know, it returns false and, and so on. Uh, so that they're very interesting exercises. One of them is piano numbers. Uh, you know, piano, you can implement it in a recursive or iterative way. And the interesting thing is that uh, we're using, why is that? Uh, for example, this is zero, O, and I can add O to one, 
of course, it will return one. And if I add one to one, mm, sorry, you will see that two will automatically appear. And so the idea is uh, it's very interesting to see, you know, how the numbers are created while you are working with them. <clears throat> uh, so let's add one to two. We we'll have three. One of the exercises they have to do with that is uh, they have to implement factorial using TDD. That's an interesting way of uh, uh, learn TDD and use that in an environment like this one. Uh, okay, and so on. Uh, the latest one is related to do a light, you know, traffic light, and the idea is uh, for them to get to something like this, where you get the lights and you can make them work. And of course, all these using only objects. Um, and at the end, when you are done, you just, and we, we teach them about, you know, how to use prototypes and those kind of things. At the end, we tell them how we can from here go to classes. And there is an option to create the class based on, on that. And um, okay, done. Thank you. Good feed, all right? Okay, I will do it quick because it's a little bit late. So I will talk about um, my activities in Africa to promote small talk. So since a few years, we have a, a mailing list uh, uh, as a Google Groups here. You can see the address. And uh, the, we are not that much people in this mailing list, but there are people from Togo, Cameroon, Algeria, Senegal, and South Africa. Uh, the mailing list is not really active, but uh, if you want to join, this is possible. And we have one company uh, at the moment uh, uh, called Inspired that is located in South Africa. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm also doing a workshop uh, in Africa about live programming and uh, IoT. In fact, uh, this workshop has not been done in Africa, but in Vietnam. And Vietnam, in Vietnam, you see a lot of Africans here, but in Vietnam, there is a French uh, school uh, that teach to French-speaking students around the world. And mo most of the, 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 the students of the school are African students, in fact. So I have made a, a workshop here about Faro things. Uh, OK. And. Uh, since uh, September uh, 2017, I'm located in Cameroon, so in uh, Central Africa. I'm, I put a map here just to, so you, you know where is it located. And uh, I made a, a group, a study group of Faro, so something like five or between five and eight students. You can see uh, tweets from a very active uh, girl from the group, Pamela. Uh, she's very enthusiastic about the, 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 the group, and we are doing. Uh, uh, TDD, we are doing coding dojos, we have started to read the book of uh, Alexandre Berger, so we built all the neural networks with the students. Uh, I have some master students that want to do uh, now a master thesis and a PhD uh, in Faro. I teach uh, software engineering lecture, I have a software engineering lecture on Faro with uh, more than 100 uh, students. We have a, a channel on Discord called Faro Khmer. Uh, Stefan was uh, well, didn't understand what, what uh, Khmer means, but Khmer means Cameroon. In fact, this is a, an acronym for Cameroon. So that's it. Thank you for for your attention. Hello again. Okay, I will be super fast. So this talk is uh, using 128 GPU cores, TensorFlow, and VS Smalltalk to detect Koch beers in the uh, ISO uh, 11 pictures. Yeah? So, you will see pictures, you will see beers, don't worry. So, um, uh, this is a NVIDIA, JSON Nano. It's a board that has uh, four gigs of RAM, uh, ARM64 processor, uh, but the cool thing that it has a GPU of uh, 128 cores, and the whole thing is under $100. So it's, uh, it caught a lot of attraction for doing uh, machine learning and heavy computations. 
Uh, I have one right there, which I will be connecting to it, uh, but I didn't want to spend time. So during the demo, you will see it in action. And if you want to see it, I can show you. OK, so these are some of the uh, pictures that I could find on Twitter. Uh, I didn't want to put a picture from everybody because uh, free run C. Uh, but uh, you can see. So this is uh, this was Kosh. This is, I don't know, I guess it's Kosh, but I'm not sure. No, that was no. OK, so OK. This one is. Um, OK, I guess those are plenty of, of here. This is this was Kosh as well. This was Kosh. Uh, OK, thank you. You did a, you did a great, uh, great job for drinking all those beers. Uh, so I could train a little bit the model um, and see what uh, happened. So I will now, um, actually, I did not train it. I just verify. Um, so I will, uh, here I am connected already through BNC to uh, that uh, board. And I have here this example where I just specify the, uh, uh, the levels that are used for rendering boxes. Uh, I tell which TensorFlow model to use. And I add uh, one of those images. And then uh, I do some stamp and I uh, predict and analyze what is on the image. So I will run it. Uh, it's a little bit slow because it's through BNC with, a, with my mini rotor. But you can see it started to link against CUDA because the, the GPU processor is CUDA. So it, and it has its own uh, dedicated memory. So it's not using the ARM processors at all. The only ARM execution here is the FFI call from BS Motok. And all the rest is running uh, with the GPU course. Um, this model that I'm running is really heavy. Uh, the proto buffer uh, of the graph is like 200 megabytes. So it's really heavy uh, model. I think it's, it should be about to finish. And we will see. OK. So let's see if it managed to, OK, at least I am recognized as a person. See here, you can see person at the 50%, OK. Uh, half person. And oh, look, you're 33, even worse. <laughs> and the beers, you see Kolsch. Yes, twice, because there's another beer on the, on the right, and 60%. You see the Kolsch? I did detect it with 60%. Um, it also detected the one on the right. And the last one on the back, it did not. OK. Um, it was fun. You know, I, I, it was a nice uh, experiment. Uh, but um, uh, I will be honest, I didn't train the model uh, for that. It's not that it's not possible, but it's not something I can do at uh, 2 in the morning after having drink those, those many beers. So I hug a little bit, so I changed the labels. Well, it would say, I don't remember if it was beer or bottle, whatever the model detected, I just replaced it for Kolsch. So it was a little hack, uh, but I think it was uh, fun to show. And what I wanted, really wanted to show is that we have TensorFlow running with full GPU. Uh, we are really using the 100 cores for this from BS Smalltalk. And there you go. There are some other examples, real ones that we took uh, on previous cases, uh, like that one. And that's all I wanted to thank the whole team of instantiation that uh, they helped me a lot for this demo. They, they work really hard. So thank you. And that's all. OK. Uh... So I'm here to tell you about a problem I had or a challenge I faced with while developing Dr. TDD. As I evolved the systems, I started having a lot of tests. And I really mean a lot of tests, probably more than 500. So it was hard to manage. And I often wanted to know uh, which test affected which cases that I was interested in. And I couldn't manage that. At first, as every software system, I started it with an Excel file. 
and it didn't scale, of course. So I thought, wait a minute, let's, we are small talkers, we, we can do better, right? So uh, I structured my test this way, this way with give and then when. In this, we're seeing a test here that the starting st state is red. When all tests pass, then the final state should be green, all right? So this is what I had in the Excel file. What I did basically is I refined that selector so I could query all the tests and I created this browser. So in this browser, I can see quickly which tests are talking are starting from a green state. At, uh, in the same way, I can query all the tests that ends in a red state, no matter what the starting state is. Uh, this was fine. I could work here also, write my test here. If I save here, it will run the test. Uh, but as I kept adding more tests, this wasn't enough. So I needed to see what I was uh, managing. So I did this. Once you had the selector refined, then you can do whatever you want. In this case, I can see the starting from the green state. I see the transitions using a tooltip, and I can see the final state. All right. So, and if you notice, I can query the, the test using natural language, all right? Uh, after that, that wasn't enough, so I had a question. Hey, is it possible to go from green state to, to say uh, red state in a certain number of steps, and am I missing that uh, test case? So we have a graph, so we can do it. I can query, okay, if I start from the green steps, which means all tests are passing, and I wanna know if it's possible to reach the red state, I put that on the target uh, state, and I can see this, starting from green, I, ha I can reach red, and I can do it first writing a new test, of course, and then running it, or I can do it in, in, in different uh, ways, which is not the, the, the typical TDD cycle. Um, so this means that if I don't have this test, I mean, starting from green and go to red through this state, now I can generate it automatically, because all I have to do is to take the setup, setup and the act from the green, append the setup and the act from this test case, which I have, and then I have the setup ready for that test that I'm missing. Other things that I can do, this is the last thing I'm going to show you. Let's keep it that way. I can see the whole system, all right? That, that is Dr. TDD with all the transitions. Uh, there are more cool things uh, you can do. I will leave this as a question. How do you detect in your systems that you don't have a false positive? What will be a false positive in this case? Uh, this test, the title says it, start, it starts in red, but this, this might be starting in another state, right? And the rest of the collaborations may get test passed anyway, and, and what ends up happening is that this test is not testing what the selector is doing. So how do you detect that? I leave that as a question. What I can say is that I can detect that using this button. If you wanna take a look at it, you can come and we'll talk later. Thank you. So hello again. So today I will not present a project that you can use, but it's more a project that I did for myself and uh, I think it can inspire people. So in Faro, we have uh, the setting browser, but uh, personally, I find it uh, it's good when we start, but for me, I want to customize my environment more. And um, so in Faro, the, uh, there is a way to manage settings. So we have uh, a folder that can contain preferences. So open. So, on uh, each uh, system, we have uh, folders that can contain preferences, and we uh, can have a Faro, uh, a Faro folder in it. And if a, a .st file is found at startup, it will, uh, Faro will launch it. 
And for example, what I did is a little ST file saying that I will load a Metacello meta project. And then at uh, each time I start Faro, where I have settings that get uh, installed. And I, had, I customize my, my environment with that in multiple ways. First way is that I had class initialization to uh, classes in the project. And like that, the code will be run when uh, my, my image will be open for the first time. So I can do things like, uh, like uh, setting my uh, author name or uh, updating the, app the appearance, uh, changing my uh, local folders, etc. I uh, use it also to generate this uh, little menu that uh, contains uh, a lot of uh, little templates or uh, convenience methods that I am running uh, often, like for example, browse uh, the icons uh, in Faro and things like that. I uh, can also add extension methods, like uh, for example, I, um, I often uh, do some profilings, and when I add a time profiler in the code, when I want to use the result of uh, what I profile, it's always uh, boring to save, uh, to uh, add the temporary variables, etc. So I added spy on block closure, and it will uh, do the saving the result for me, uh, and I will not care, etc. I, uh, I use it uh, also uh, to add uh, new classes in Faro, like for example, some, uh, run, some uh, rules or uh, my uh, current uh, theme. So I, uh, I can use it to, or I use it also to add uh, commands in uh, iceberg context menus, because when uh, it's, uh, it makes sense only for my workflow and I don't want to push it uh, for everyone. And uh, another thing I, can, I do also, uh, also sometimes is to change the system uh, using metalinks. So with metalinks, you can uh, add code to methods, but without impacting the method. And uh, since I'm a contribute uh, often to Faro, I don't want to, uh, to change the code of Faro with my settings. So to do that, I use, uh, I use uh, metalinks, like, uh, for example, I have some hack in uh, Iceberg. And I will, say, uh, I will say, as example, that uh, I want to change the method uh, can be executed in context of the class as tip uh, checkout branch command, and I will re replace it with my own method, uh, etc. So that's it. It's uh, my way to uh, customize my environment, and I think it makes it really it makes me really more productive. And maybe you can uh, get inspired. I have uh, the code. If if you are interested, I have the, my code on uh, directly on GitHub. And uh, so you can check it. There is something else? No? Okay. Uh, then uh, thank you a lot. Uh, see you tomorrow.